ourselves because we are in the presence of the greatest lover of them all. That's right, that's right. How many uh, bog down you're tired? Uh -huh, uh -huh. You're tired. Yeah. How many times, how many of you feel like giving up at time? How many feel hopeless at times? But think about Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says that he never sleeps. Nor slumbers. He is busy working and interceding on our behalf. And all he asks for his children to do is worship him. Just express how much you love him. So can we change the atmosphere? Can we shift? Can we just sing that one more time? I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on. You know the song. I worship and adore you. Think about his goodness. Just want to tell you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you more than anything. Say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you, God. I worship and adore you. I just want to tell you. Just want to tell you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. you more than my wife. I love you more than my children. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Mm, I worship and adore you. I worship and adore you. I just want to tell you. Just want to tell you. Lord, I love you more than anything. How many know that Jesus went to Calvary? Just to save a wretch like me. That's love. Is that love? Do you know the song Jesus went to Calvary? Praise God. Jesus mm. went. Come on, this is worship now. Worship him in your own way. Save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. That's love. Say Jesus went. Jesus went. Thank you, Lord. To Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. I don't think they are convinced. That's love. We say Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Jesus. Save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. How many know that they hung him high? They stretched him wide. They hung him high. Uh huh. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me, he died. For me, he died. That's love. Think about his goodness. Mm. That's love. They hung him high.
Thank you, Lord. Come on and put your hands together for the love of God. We praise your name. Amen. Thank you for your love. Very quickly, I want to go right into our tabernacle of praise, Stuport News. Amen. You may be seated, choir. Praise the Lord. Our Stuport News. Very important question. All right, well, my slides are moving by itself. Please stop that, please. Why is it important? For Christians to always give what, everybody? Faithful time and a faithful offering. Why is it important? We are all blessed, right? Amen. Faithful you receive, faithfully you give. And so my giving, let's make it personal, my giving is what? Important. Do you believe that? Ministries are able to do what? Function. All right, it's going by itself. Ministries are able to function effectively and are able to do more in and outside of? Church. Why? Because Church. my giving. It helps ministry to function effectively. Amen? Amen? Also, my giving is important because it helps react. The church is blessed, how? Abundantly. By God when I give? All, all of the time. All of the time. Just sometimes? All, all of the time. My giving helps the church fulfill its what? Mission. Its vision and its mission. How many want Tabernacle of Praise to be a blessed church? Amen. We really want this church to be a church for all people. Amen. And so we, we want to be able to minister to those who are hungry, to those who are poor. Amen? Amen. You also want to meet um, those who are sick. We want to be able to help members and even those who are outside of this church. We want to help them get the help that they need physically. Amen? Amen. And, so, and so this is not just a church we open up on Saturday morning and then close it. I'm looking for the day when Tabernacle of Praise can be open seven days a week. Hello. Not just having, not just, not just having um, church service, but also being able to have our lifestyle classes, not just on Saturdays, amen. but even through the week, amen? amen? Be able to have an education, use our education wing, wing, wing when children can come. Amen. People can get their GEDs, people can learn how to use the computer, meeting the felt needs. Amen. And so it is important that we give. So not, these are not the only reasons to give. One, to fund the budget. <laughs> um, two, to pay what? The bill. Mm -hmm. To get the building project dollars. Yeah. Uh -huh. Not the only reasons to give. But the number one motivation to give is to do what? Transform lives. That's what we're all about. Amen? Amen? To transform lives. God's goal is to always transform lives. Men and women, boys and girls, transformed by the truth and the power of God's word is number one. Amen. And so today we want to not, we don't want to collect our tithes and offering. We want to receive. Right. Hello. Right. Our tithes and offering. So if you today, first of the, first of the, first of the month, we want to um, ask you to take up your tithes. If you have an envelope. You ready? Get your tie. Let's raise it up in the air. Let's do it. Let's show. Let's show God that we are grateful. Uh -huh. If you have your tithes, if you don't have a tithe envelope, just ask for one. Or if you have your money, you want to just raise it up in the air as well. Just saying, God, I give you thanks. Uh -huh. Thank you. you need an envelope. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, I'm returning to you what belongs to you. 
How many of you got your taxes back, refund? <laughs> Not yet, right? It's coming, it's coming. Let's, let's, bless, let's bless the host of God, amen? And so I'm going to ask our deacons to come forward now as we receive our morning's tithes and offering. He 
God for the blood the saving blood of Jesus Christ amen is there still power in the blood <laughs> we're not going to go there today <laughs> thank you Lord his blood is able to transform. <laughs> You're trying to start something, man. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, choir, and all of our leaders for leading our worship service today. 
I'll preach about the blood later. Is that all right? <laughs> amen, amen. I don't know about you, but I'm so excited about this day. Uh, look at this church. We are seeking to go beyond the walls. We, we have on our uniform, amen? So that when we go beyond the walls, people know who we are. And so those of you who have yet to receive your t-shirts... I do have the orders in, but also we, we want all of our members, every, the first Sabbath of every month, we're here, and this is how we're going to come, going to, come to church, dressing our t-shirts, amen? amen? And so we, we appreciate everyone being able to um, get one of the t-shirts. Right after our charge. We will organize, amen? amen, to go beyond the walls, and we will go, and then we will come back, okay, um, before we eat, amen. 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 We don't want no sleeping soldiers. You have no power after you finish eating. We know how... Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. We don't want it to kick in. So, 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 we want to get the charge and then we go out. Amen? Because we know that the enemy is busy and so we don't want no one to get distracted. That's what happens. We don't want no one to get distracted. And so even if you don't have a t-shirt on, um, please feel free to go with us if you're able to go. We really appreciate that. All right. If you can take your Bibles now and turn with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, and then also I need you to find the Gospel of Luke. Go to the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 20, and so we will begin with Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. Be reading from the King James Version. And so if you have it, say amen. amen. Can we all stand in the presence of God as we honor his word today? Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7. This is what the prophet Isaiah writes. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that said unto Zion, thy God, what, everybody? Let's, know, let's now go to Luke chapter 4 now. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. We will now read this responsively. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. You have it, say amen. amen. Verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a theme of him through all the region round about. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, say custom, he went where, everybody? On and stood up for to read. Read verse 17. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. All together, and he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, 
and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Whew. He closed the book. But their eyes were still on the word. Ooh. Mm -hmm. my, my God, my God, my God. All right, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna today focus on the Great Commission. Let us pray. Father, it is your time. Speak to us. Empower us. You are the Lord of the harvest. And we pray, O oh God, that you will minister to us, your soldiers, Lord, as we prepare to go beyond the walls. Bless now your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. The eyes are on Jesus. And so our study today is entitled The Great Commission. The servant of the Lord, Ellen G. White, a wonderful Christian author, penned these words. She says, Christ, what everybody? His method alone will give true what? In reaching the people. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. Here is Jesus' formula for success when it comes to reaching the lost. Here it is. He socialized. Say socialized. In the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 14, the author writes, And the word, who everybody? That's Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. My dear friends, Jesus came and he still comes to us today. Who says amen? amen. Now get this. The term dwelt among us actually means he came and pitched his tent among us. Can I break it down? He didn't wait for humanity to get its act together. <laughs> Jesus didn't wait for us to move into his neighborhood. Rather, the word Jesus Christ moved into our sin-infested, pain-scarred neighborhood, and he pitched a tent. He socialized with the rich and the poor. He socialized uh, with the healthy and the sick. He socialized with his friends and with his enemies. He socialized with the believer and with the unbeliever. Jesus socialized with ordinary people just like you and me today. Like Jesus, it's time for us to pitch some tents in our own neighborhood. It's time for the church to mingle more with the lost. Who says amen? amen? He socialized. But he also did what, everybody? When Mary and Martha were weeping over the death of their brother Lazarus, the Bible says there in John chapter 11, verse 35, that Jesus did what? He wept. I love how Paul puts it there in Hebrews. Paul says this in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are yet without, what everybody? Without sin. Please keep that in mind. I'm going to break it down. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted to lust, despair, and anger. He was tempted to pride, selfishness, fear, apathy, and unbelief. He has been there, folks. He endured the worst Satan could throw at him for 33 years without caving in. Some of us give up. We cave in. But Jesus is our example. Amen? And so, and so, my dear friends, he is the world's good Samaritan binding up the wounds of aching humanity. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted and graciously did he fulfill his commission. Not only 
and he sympathized, but he did what? Come on, speak to me. He did what? He served. One of the most effective ways to reach people with the message of Jesus today is through real and relevant acts of service. Do you believe that? To tell the truth, we must show the truth. To tell the truth, we must show it. Actions speak louder than what? It's the model Jesus used. He served, he met needs, and then people listened. Let me say that again. This is what he did. He served, he met needs, and then what? People. Today, I'm so glad that I serve a Savior that cares so much for me. I found out that he is able to meet my spiritual, emotional, as well as my physical need. So instead of looking at our situations and being fearful, we should look to Jesus and trust him to help us. Our God knows how to serve us. Salvation. How many know that Jesus saves? Do you believe that? First Timothy, be writing it, writing the text down. First Timothy chapter two, verses three, four, and six. First Timothy chapter two, three, four, and six. Here's what Paul says to young Timothy. He says, God, our Savior, desires all men to be saved. He didn't say some men. He says he desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This is why Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. The Savior was willing to socialize. He was willing to sympathize and to serve others in order to win a lost soul to him. What are we willing to do? In order to help someone. Are you willing to give some of your time? To give some of your money? Are you willing to give in order to help one soul at a time? What are we willing to do this year as a church? To reach the lost for Christ. After his resurrection, Christ appeared to his disciples and said this to them. Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 through 20. Jesus says, do what? And baptizing and off and off, teaching them to do what? Whatsoever I have commanded you, and what? Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. For some, these are just words. How do I know? Our action will show. I told you before, we're not playing church, right? And I'm not sent, I'm not sent here to just make you feel comfortable. I'm not saying here to make you just clap your hands and shout. I'm sent by God. One, to wake some of us up. Two, to keep the church alive. Jesus says, here it is. Look at this. He says, go. Right? Now, here, Jesus is making a call to discipleship. Right? 
Now, go. And he says, I have commanded you, right? And the Bible says, the Bible says, sin is lawlessness, right? What is sin? Lawlessness, right? Transgression or breaking God's law, right? And Jesus says there, if you love me, Oh, you were looking for the Ten Commandments? But isn't this a command of God as well? So when I refuse to go, well, the church don't need me. They have all of the other people wearing yellow. Now, I know some people, they, because of health, they cannot go. That's all right. But there's still a work that they can do. But we're talking about those who will just make these excuses. I don't need to go. No, you do need to go because God has given you the ability to help someone else. I cannot reach everybody. But you have that personality that can connect with somebody. And, be, and when, when the enemy causes us to refuse to do what God has commanded us to do, we are causing someone to lose our own salvation. I'm off my notes now. Praise the Lord because the Holy Spirit is speaking. Because I've been, I've been in church for a while now. When it comes to outreach, people hate it. Some, they don't show up to church. I know it. Oh, it's going to be a dead day. What? What's wrong with, what's wrong with people? But God says, go. It is important for us to listen to God. Move on. How many know that we live in a needy world? We live in a needy world. There are people in our world who are in need of attention, in need of a political or sports hero, perhaps in need of a man or woman to bring them satisfaction and enjoyment, in need of money and fame, in need of healing and comfort. But what this world needs most is the Lord. Amen. Why? Because Jesus is the living example of God's will for us. He died for our sins to save us. Oh beloved, our relationship with Jesus Christ provides hope, a reason and purpose to live in this chaotic and dysfunctional world. This world is not going to get better. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus every day because in him I find strength, joy, peace, Comfort, purpose, wisdom, and unconditional love. Now, I said in him. You see why some people are living without peace, without hope, because they are not in Christ. They have no connection with him. I'm glad that in Christ, we can find peace. So God has given us this command to go and make what everybody? To go and make disciples. This is an explicit call to obedience. Ellen White defines obedience. Here it is. I love it. She defines obedience as the service and allegiance of love. She says that it is the true sign of discipleship. Obedience. And it is the test of discipleship. My God. God is not going to tempt us. That's the work of the devil. But God will test us. Action. Speaks. Louder. Than words. Jesus says go. Go. And make disciples. But notice that he says we are to make disciples, not destroy them. This requires, making disciples requires more than just holding one meeting and getting someone to come forward and make a decision for Christ. 
This is one of the areas where the church, I'm talking about the church, the worldwide church, have not been as obedient as we should. Can I break it down? Many times we aim to get people on our church books, but don't make them disciples of Christ. That is why we find many people leaving the church days or weeks after they've been baptized. Why? Because they have not been grounded in Christ and they have not been taught how to grow in his grace and in his knowledge and they have not been taught how to live a seven-day life, not just as a seventh-day Adventist, but as a seven-day Christian. Yeah, folks who are just one-day Christian. Just for a few hours. And some of the neighbors are looking out saying, who are they fooling? And we even have, get this, we even have those who stay in the church. Here it is. Those who stay in the church but still struggle. With biblical teachings of the church, what am I talking about? The Sabbath. How do I keep it? When do I keep it? Should I work on the Sabbath? For years they've been struggling with this. But the Bible says that Jesus asked his custom, you read it, he was where? In the synagogue where? When? On the Sabbath day. Well, God knows my heart. I, I talked to someone this week, not a member of the church. God knows my heart. I need some money. I got to do what I have to do. What? When we Acknowledge God's holy day. We are saying to the world, I trust in my creator. Yes, this is one of the busiest days for the world to go and make money, but guess what? I trust in my creator. My God will supply all of my needs. So I'm showing the world I don't need to work on his day because he commanded that I do no work. And the enemy just fools some people. Well, come on, man. You're going to let your light turn off? You're going to let your, your children starve? We got to trust God. But even for those who don't work on the Sabbath, we got to keep it holy. Watch. We got we to make sure we're not watching any secular or listening to anything, anything that is secular on God's holy day. Matter of fact, you shouldn't even be watching it at all. Yeah, hello, some people don't like this now. Kids playing games on the Sabbath, people going out to eat on the Sabbath. Oh boy, oh boy. Mm. Keeping God's day holy. We are a holy people. We are peculiar people. We should be different. Boy, I know, I know, I know. Holy Spirit is convicting. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm just, whatever he's putting in my heart to say right now, I'm saying it. We have to get back to the word of God and be Seventh-day Adventist Christians. Jesus, he just told me to say this. We need to get the, our house in order. Before we go out, we want to get our house in order. Now, not only about the Sabbath, there are also those who are in the church struggling with sex outside of marriage. And then, then you have those who are married struggling with sex <laughs> in the marriage. 
staying committed to the marriage vows. People, people have a little, they, they struggle with this. Living a healthy lifestyle, and not only with what we put in our bodies, but with what and whom we surround ourselves with. Man, I told you before, do not hang with buzzards. Buzzards are there to eat you up. That's why I had to leave some friends. I'm not hating on them, but they can't participate in what they're doing. So when they, took, when they take out the, the little weed, time for me to leave. Peace. You start drinking because I know the flesh. After a while, man, that thing, look, that thing looks good. You just see the nice cold bear and all of that. That's just nice, nice and cold. I just get a little taste, man. It's all right. A little wine is good for the stomach. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with us, man? We, have to, we, just, we just lie to ourselves. I'll, I, 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 I'll just watch it for, you know, just, I'll just be with them for a little bit. And the minutes later, you're like, what happened? When you play with the enemy, you will get burned. And so if you know that you're not strong enough, you have to be around people that will build you up, that will empower you, that will help you to be a better person. I don't apologize for what I'm saying, but I just have to let the word, teach the word, right? Okay. My dear friends, Christian disciples, look at this. I said Christian disciples. Who, who are you following? Christian disciples emulate, follow their, imitate, they follow. The master, Jesus, in every aspect of their daily lives, they walk daily in his footsteps. They live as he lived. Christ, hear this, this don't, don't miss this. Christ never, say never. never. He never compromised his faith. Amen. Let's break it down. He never lived a double life. The Bible says, that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You cannot trust a double-minded person. There are people that will mess up the work of God because the church allowed certain things to happen that should not be happening. Some of you know some things you know some people are doing wrong and you fail to call them out. We cannot be an unstable church. We got to be Christians. We got to be disciples of Christ. Christ never conformed. He never compromised. He never lived a double life. He never conformed to the practices of the world. Here it is. Breaking it down. You see Christ, he lived amongst the people, right? But he did not become like the people. He lived amongst the people, but he did not become like the people. He developed relationships, and this allowed him to reach not just the poor, but also the rich, not just the Jew, but also the Gentile. All were drawn to him. The alcoholic, the rapist, the prostitute, the drug addict, the liars, the sex offenders, the outcast, the idol worshiper, all were drawn to the Savior. Jesus didn't do things that violated his temple, the body. He didn't do things that violated his mind and his faith in God. He was all.
always mission minded. He was always what? Jesus is and has always been an agent of change. An agent of change. That's why in the back we are what? Uh huh. And the question I have for you is this Are you an agent of change? Because of your daily lifestyle, do you draw people to Christ or do you repel, do you deter, do you prevent them from him? Our goal should not be to conform to the world, to reach the world. I'm going to say that again. Our goal should not be to conform to the world, to reach the world, but to build relationships that point the world to Christ. And so I don't have to become an alcoholic in order to reach the alcoholics. I don't have to become an idol worshiper to reach those that are serving false gods. I definitely do not have to dress and act like a gangster in order to reach the thugs that are on our streets. Because some people have it twisted. I don't have to become like them. So then how do we reach such people? Simple. The word of God. Develop a relationship with them. That's all. Amen. Amen. The mission of the church is not to build buildings, not to stockpile cash, not to pad our pews so that we can sit in comfort. Not that there's anything wrong with these things, but they are not the mission. The mission of the church is to take the good news of Jesus to the whole world and make disciples of all nations. And so I say with Isaiah, Isaiah, here it is. We just read the text, Isaiah 52 verse 7. How what? Where? Out of feet of those who bring what? Uh, look at your feet. Look, look at it right now. Is it beautiful? I don't know how it looks. I don't know how it smells. But the Bible says how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, you're what? The gospel changes everything, my dear friends. The gospel, it changes everything. The gospel proclaims liberty to those that, uh, that abound with fears, those who are weary and heavy laden under the burden of sin. They are able to find relief in Christ. They're able to shake themselves from the dust of their doubts and fears and loose themselves from those bands. The gospel changes everything. The price paid by the Redeemer for our salvation was not silver or gold or corruptible things, but his own precious blood. The good news is Jesus reigns. He is sovereign. He rules. In him we have the victory. And in him all things hold together. And I say hallelujah. That's good news. The one that is keeping the stars in place. The one that is holding the sun in its place. The one that is keeping the wave from sweeping over us. Is holding us together. That's amazing. Wow. Jesus says go. And make disciples. And so... You must understand that the task of discipleship is a 24-7 commitment. I said 24-7, right? Commitment. At home. Because our children are watching us. In the worship place. And even in the workplace, 24-7, God has given us a last day message, three angels' message there in Revelation chapter 14, to deliver to a dying and sin-infested world. This message is not for us to keep to ourselves, but we must share it. 
This message is not bad news, but it is good news. And we should never be ashamed of the message of Jesus Christ. Like Paul, we should all declare, for I am not a what? Ashamed of the gospel because it is, what everybody? The power of God that brings, to salva that brings salvation where? To everyone who believes. The power of the gospel. The gospel of Christ is powerful. It is good news. The good news of Jesus Christ is the only, get this, message in the world that has the power to set men and women free from the bondage of sin. It is the only message. It is the only message that makes Satan and his angels just tremble every time they hear it. Right now he's angry. It is the only message that lets me know that my past has been forgiven. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, uh, Paul says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. That's good news. Wow, you mean I'm not condemned? Paul goes on to say there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man or woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Some of us are still holding on to our past. Letting our past mistakes just drag us down, drag us down. Make us just mean, just miserable. Can't even love people. Can't even trust people because of what was done to us in the past. But Jesus Christ says, when you accept me, I'm about to erase everything. So if your daddy didn't love you, I love you. Your daddy left you, I'm here for you. I'm preaching to myself because that's my testimony. That's my testimony. I overcame, amen? God wants us to be victorious. Be in bondage. And thank God that he's not just our creator, but he is our recreator. Uh, you see, when I accept Christ as my Savior, when I confess my sins, turn from our wicked ways, and allow him to control the way I live, my past mistakes are erased. My past mistakes are forgiven. I'm given a new start, a new beginning, a new outlook on life, that's good news. The gospel of Christ is powerful. It is good news. It is the only message that is able to give hope to the hopeless. Evangelism, my dear friends, is not an option for Christians. Disciple making, soul winning, is not an option for Christians. You heard that before, right? Look at this. Repetition deepens what? The impression, right? Here's this slide again. When a church ceases to be what? Involved in what? That church ceases to be what? Because mission is where? How many want to close the church down? I'm just being real. This is what we're about, right? And so, and so we, we cannot stop. We got to be about God's business. You know, let, let me tell you the truth. Here it is. Here it is. My study. Done research. Many of our churches in North America are dying because they have lost their passion for evangelism and disciple making. I'm not just talking about Seven Day Adventists. There are people with, I mean, you, you, you pass some of the churches, I mean, they, they, they have large buildings. And it seems like a lot of people are flocking there. But you know what? They can do all of the, all of the programs. All of the singing and everything else that, that comes along with it. 
But if, if they're not seeking to make disciples of Christ, and if they're, if they're not leading people into the truth, not the true church. And many of our churches are dying. How do we fix it? Go and make disciples. God has charged us with a wonderful responsibility. The opportunity to work together with him, teaching others to observe all things that we have learned of him. We are partnering up with God to grow his kingdom. Wow, for real? God wants me to be his co-worker? What? That's powerful. Wow. If that's not exciting, I don't know what is. I really don't. And the promise is there, and it, it, we just read it, that he will be with us. Amen? Amen. We today must hold on to his promise. Jesus' presence is our encouragement, our help, our source of strength and power. He, more than we can ever fathom, has a heart for the lost and has given his all to offer salvation to the people we are seeking to reach today. I'm just teaching today. Is that all right? It's our charge. How will my church grow? Let's make it personal. How will tabernacle of praise grow? Who said we have to be here? In this building. In the next five or seven years. I'm not doubting God's power. Because I believe that when we really get busy, and really get serious about doing oh, yeah. this work, yes, we will have no room. Yes, We're going to have to move out. Yes, Don't get... As long as God allows me to stay here, don't get comfortable. I'm even thinking about, I'm even thinking about our older members. We talk about the elders of the board, talk about it. Y'all have to come up and down these stairs. We don't want y'all to keep on doing that. We care. Amen? Amen. And so we, get, we, are, we have to always have church growth eyes. What can we do to make our facility better? To make ministry more effective? What can we do? So how will my church grow? Here it is. It begins with me, the pastor. Must what? I do. Pastor must want the church to go and be willing to do what? Be willing to pay the price. Sometimes I'm going to have to tell my wife, my children, I have to go here and minister. I have to go and see so, so and so. I have to hold this evangelistic meeting for two or four weeks. I have to be willing to pay the price. Can I be honest with you? So we can make sure that as we move forward, because this is the day, that this is a new beginning for Tabernacle of Praise. I see it right now. And what God says, we have to erase some things. We have to stop doing some things that, that we shouldn't be doing. Let me go to number two first. The people must want the church to do what? And be what? As a father, at times you have to rebuke your children. And I'm doing it in love. Don't take it personal. If you take it personal, that means the Holy Spirit is convicting you. This is an encouragement. When we started the New Beginnings series, you know who I preached to? 
the choir. We cannot be doing that. We appreciate the choir. But we need more people to show up when we have meetings. I know some of us live far. But if this church was 300 miles, I will be there. This is not just my vocation, but this, this is a calling. This is a ministry for me. And so, look at this. You have a pastor that cares about you. You have a pastor that will not bring garbage to you. You have a pastor that would take time to stay in God's word, to be interceding on your behalf. And so after I'm finished studying and praying and doing visitation, I still have to leave the host and come to church. A crowd draws a crowd. This community sees who, who comes here every Sabbath or through the week. And if we are not excited about what's happening, they're not going to be here. It is just an encouragement. It is just an encouragement. Why all of these other churches, like, I'm not hating on Friendly Temple, Peace, Prince of Peace. I'm not hating on them. Why all of them are happy with their church? Something is going on. And members take ownership. I'm not just talking about the faithful few, but we need more people to take ownership of tab tabernacle of praise. I will be there for prayer meetings. Some, some prayer meetings, I cannot make it, but you know what? I'm going to try to make at least one or two a month. I mean, we, we have some amazing prayer meetings. It, 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 it's a blessing. Remember I talk about paying the price? Perhaps I need to change my schedule. I have to make some adjustments. So you know what? Before I, I always tell people, before I make someone else better, make myself better, I'm going to make the place God has called me to serve better. Hello. Hello. Do you believe what is happening at this church? Are you encouraged with your sin? Yes. I'm just saying what God is saying to say to us. Number three, and we're almost done. You can stop playing Elder Joseph. The church must agree that the goal of evangelism is to do what? Yes. Number four, the church must not what? Yes. Or teach or what? Yes. Without what? Yes. Don't do it. Without first. Having the spirit in you. So before Jesus started his ministry, he was what? He was led into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the enemy. The spirit led him. But because he was filled with the spirit, no matter what the enemy threw at him, he was able to say, it is written. I'm connected. It's not just lip service, but I have a connection with the word. And so, how do we get the Holy Spirit? Do I have to push you down to get the Holy Spirit? False. Can I just stop, there, stop right there for a second? All of that stuff is not the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus came to people who were sick, people who were broken, they came to him for help. Did he push them down? Matter of fact, they were down, right? Why do you push down a down person? Downcast. But what Jesus did, and look what the disciples did when they saw that beggar that was at the gate, they what? That's 
the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do I receive it? Get the Holy Spirit through baptism? You're being baptized. Also, Jesus says this, and I say unto you, what? And it shall be what? Seek, and you shall what? Knock, and it shall be what? He says, for everyone, everyone, a child, everyone mm, that asketh what? And he that what? And to him that what? It shall be what? And here it is. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that what? How many want the Holy Spirit? You have to ask for the Holy Spirit. You have, to, you have to just linger in his presence like the disciples did. On the day of Pentecost, they, st they stayed in that upper room for 10 days. Some people cannot stay in the presence of God for just three minutes. But Jesus says to them before he ascended, he says the Holy Spirit will come. And oh boy, it came. It says all flesh began to prophesy. They began to talk about the miracles of God. What a great day. People said, oh man, those, those people are drunk. Peter said, Peter, you, you remember Peter, right? The one, that, the one that denied Jesus? The one that left Jesus? The one that abandoned Jesus? He said, I will be with you. Peter was lying. But on the day of Pentecost, because this man of God, this one, this one who lied, this one who cheated, this one who went against God. The Bible says he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he would, he would receive boldness and courage and that he stood up. He says, what's wrong with you people? I'm just paraphrasing. These men are not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. What's wrong? These people are filled with God's Spirit. And Peter began to preach. He began to tell them about the life of Jesus Christ. How he came to die for those who, who, are, who are in sin. And how he was buried. And then on three days he rose again. Peter began to preach. And the Bible says, you read it, Acts chapter 2. The Bible says that the people were angry. And in their anger, they asked a question. What must we do then? Thank you, Jesus. I, I believe Peter, Peter said in his mind, I'm glad you asked. He says, repent and be baptized. And on that day, over 3,000 souls were saved. And then you read on. The elders, we did it today in our, in our study in our, on the prayer line. Is that the people were on one accord. They followed the teachings of the apostles. The people fellowshiped with one another. The people sold everything that they owned to help others. And the Bible says, look at it, Acts chapter 2. The Bible says because of their willingness, because of them being filled with the power of God and putting self aside, the Bible says that daily Christ added to the church. Can we have one of those can we have that experience? When you come to me, pastor, I've just studied with this individual, my co-worker, my friend, pastor, I've discipled this person, and now they're requesting to be baptized. Pastor, I've brought this person to church. They are enjoying the worship service. Pastor, can you call them? Can you minister to them? Pastor, can you help me? Can, can we have one? Can we do that? So the call to reach, this is just a call. I'm just empowering us. Let's reach our families. This is our Jerusalem. This is our Samaria. Our families, there are people who are in our families that are not saved. Children not saved. They're, they're, they're perhaps spouses that are not saved. It's time for us to really be serious about it. And it begins with me. It begins with you in your home. It's time for us to be able to reach out to our neighbors. Some people don't even talk to their neighbors. Can we do an act of service? Perhaps bake some, neighbor, bake some neighbors some cookies? Like what? Simple things. We're not inviting them to church. We're just being kind. And then they're going to ask, where do you worship? I see you go every Saturday. It's an open door. And then 
There are people in our own lives, co-workers. Some of you brought your co-workers to church, praise the Lord. You brought your, 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 your spouses, your girlfriends, boyfriends. You brought people that you love and care about. Praise God. Let's reach them. Also, are you looking St. Louis? This city is dying. Our young people are being destroyed. That's why I love to see our children. I love to see our young people out. And I love to see our young people involved in ministry. I love to encourage them, empower them, because we need to save these children. The elderly. The people who cannot make it to church. There are people in these nursing homes where their family and friends abandoned them. Wouldn't it be so nice that young and old, we can go to a nursing home and just bring love? To bring a, put a smile on someone's face? To bring the church to these areas where people are unchurched? It's amazing. This is what I'm about. I'm about soul winning. I'm about evangelism. And I ask the church, I'm asking the church, everyone, let's, let's get on board. Can we do this? And the church will grow. Who believe God's word today? We're getting ready to go beyond the walls. But before we go, it's always good to open up the doors of the church. It begins in here. So there's someone that says, Lord, I need you to forgive me. Lord, I repent. Lord, save me. Is there anyone like that today? Praise the Lord. Is there anyone else? This is your opportunity. This is your opportunity to allow God to enter in. Heads about, eyes closed. Father Lord, you saw that hand. Forgive us, your people. We pray, O oh God, that you will save. We pray, O oh God, that you will help us to be your disciples. To be true to you, O oh God. Lord, you are soon to come. And the Bible says that the enemy knows that his time is short. And so he is working overtime to distract us, your people, from doing what you have called us to do. So God, help us, oh God, to stop making excuses. There's always room for improvement. So, Father, Lord, you're looking for a church. You're looking, oh God, for a group of workers that are committed. Workers that will stand for the truth. Workers that will go beyond the call of duty. Workers, oh God, who are fired up. Workers, oh God, who are excited about soul winning. Father, you, you said in your word there are many who call on your name, but their heart, far away from you. In vain do they worship you. God, help us not to be cursed worshipers, but help us to be blessed worshipers, oh God. And so, Father, you have called me to preach the truth, to share the truth, and to tell it in love, even when your people... They just don't want to hear it. 
So Father, Lord, give your servant courage. And so God, you have used a donkey to speak your word. Truly, you can use me. If I'm just being, if I'm just willing to do what you've called me to do, you can use me to do great and marvelous things. So, Father Lord, I pray now that you prepare the way. Prepare the hearts of the individuals that we will meet. And I pray, oh God, that we will come back with a testimony. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together for God. We just praise the Lord for those that have joined us online. We thank you for being a part of our worship service. Just want to let you know on next week, Saturday, March 8th, we have an exciting worship service. Our young people will be in charge. And so please join us once again. God bless you all. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord.